Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, our special guest is Dr. Jean Morazzo, the top infectious disease doctor at UAB. Also, the V Team takes a look at breaking the stalemate over gambling. And are they ready for the 2020-21 session? What are we gonna do? Maybe we could build a fire, sing a couple of songs, huh? Why don't we try that? Didn't think so. S'mores, anyone? All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to the voice of Alabama politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and today I'm joined by Susan Britt and Josh Moon. Yes. It, it is less than 60 days until legislative session begins, Josh. We can forgive them for not having a plan in February 2020. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can forgive them for not having a plan in February 2021, and they don't have a plan. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we've talked about it. Uh, it seems like we've come up with several ideas uh, on the show. Maybe if they just listen to the show every now and then. Uh, uh, it just, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't understand what... I don't understand what they're doing. Uh, I mean, they're going to have to do this, right? I mean, there's no right. way to get out of this. Right. Uh, uh, so, I, I mean, are they just are they putting all the hopes on a vaccine that's going to be widely distributed? I, I don't understand what's going on. It's not going to happen, Susan. It's it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Not in time for session. There's no way. No. And what they're talking mm -hmm. about now is them sitting in their offices with iPads voting. Uh huh. That's exactly what <clears throat> they want. That way, the public's not there. That way, the press is not there. They can do their sneaky stuff with nobody watching. Which is what they've always wanted. That is absolutely unconstitutional to do that. It is. Yeah. It is. <clears throat> we want grocery clerks <clears throat> to stand behind the checkout counter, Josh. We want people that serve food to bring it out to the cars. Mm -hmm. And we want uh, first responders to show up in emergencies. But our legislature can't figure out how to show up for work. Yeah, you know, and not only do we want those people to show up, we're going to pass legislation uh, that prevents them from suing if we force them into a bad uh, situation. So, yeah, you know, if, if it's kind of the same way. You know what? You know what it's comparable to? It's comparable to uh, gun legislation, where we've legalized carrying guns in all sorts of places all over this state, except for the Alabama State House. Uh, where you know you get tackled <laughs> on, upon entry with a gun, uh, yes, and it's a, kind of the same deal. It's it's good for you, not for us, and so that, this is what we're looking at again. I mean, Susan, it's unbelievable. They could have gone to the governor and asked for the money to to safely do this. They could have gone to Doctor Bronner mm -hmm. over the RSA. He's got some nice big buildings. Yeah, they could have done this, but this is indicative of the. Let's not think about what we're doing. Right. It's the, it's typical of the way they do things. Now, I mean, what? honestly, all they got to do, they could get in there and get this done in less than a week. They got to pass the, the education budget. They got to pass the general fund. That's all they have to do mm -hmm. constitutionally. Okay? Yeah. What, well, well you if know, they I, work eight I, hours... Go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, you know, you, you said the, it's a it's an idea of, of not thinking. It's easy. That's the easiest thing for them to do is not think. It's it's built right in. Well, thinking's hard work, Josh. You know that. Yeah. I mean, why would you want to just listen to Fox News or MSNBC and just repeat that, or yeah. just go to Facebook and repeat that? I mean, yeah. why think? That's that's hard work. We can't have that. Well, you know, I know that that some people there. Uh, the Democrats uh, have offered up solutions uh, that would have made this safer. Uh, uh, the problem is they can't get anybody to answer the phone uh, because nobody wants to work either. Uh, and so, you know, uh, here we are. Well, uh, you know, there's 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 a lot. Of, in fairness, there's a lot of legislators that are 
in a severe health risk category. Mm -hmm. And sure. some of them that have gotten this disease no longer are mass deniers or saying mm -hmm. that it's a hoax. But we still have plenty of them that's saying there is that going on. We do hear that uh, incoming President Pro Tem, uh, Greg Reed, and uh, Budget Chair Bill Poole are working hard to find solutions to some of our biggest problems. Mm -hmm. They're working in, in conjunction with the governor's office to bring forward some bills that are going to solve some problems. And one thing that everybody agrees on is we need to have a tax, we need to, to do away with the tax on the payroll uh, protection yep. plan and the people who got $1,200 or so for uh, CARES relief. We need to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's two things. The other thing, we only got about a minute. We have to do something about the criminal justice system. We've got bills that are sitting there that need to be passed. They've already been vetted. They just need to come in, Josh, and pass them, gavel them out, and get the heck out of there if you're afraid. Yeah, you know, and uh, you're right about those bills just sitting there. They've been sitting there, most of them, for more, for more than a year now. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. because they were pre-filed prior to the last session and mm -hmm. they never got around to them. Uh, and most of those things have been discussed for multiple <coughs> years going forward uh, and are part of a larger, uh, you know, process that they've undertaken to try to reform some of these uh, criminal justice initiatives. Uh, you know, and so, I, yeah, you're right. You, the, most of those things, everybody, for the most part, already agrees on, you know, except for a few hardliners that want to make some publicity for themselves. But otherwise, right. everybody in the majority agrees on them. Well, again, if they go down there and work eight hours and, you know, an eight hour day like the rest of us do or a 12 hour day like the rest of us do, they, they, they wouldn't have as much trouble getting this done in just a few days. But we're going to have to leave it right there because we know they don't want to work too hard. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. for a drive later, maybe. Text some friends while I'm doing it. Scroll through social media. Kill a family four and a head on collision. Cool, man. Drive safe, Alabama. A message from your Alabama Department of Transportation. If you've been working, you've already proven yourself in ways you may not even notice. Managing your time, communicating effectively, and working as part of a team are key skills that employers value. At alabamaworks.com, you can find out how to build on your experience to up your game and get the job you really want because it's out there. Start your new success story at alabamaworks.com. Sponsored by Alabama Works, the Alabama Broadcasters Association, and this station. A lot can change in five years. Except those smile lines you treated with Bellafill. Because that's about how long Bellafill will keep them smooth and filled. Five years. Now you can always look your best without all those injections, appointments, and costs. Bellafill is the only dermal filler that stimulates and maintains collagen growth long term. Now time is on your side. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our special guest today is Dr. Gene Morazzo, director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at UAB. Welcome, doctor. Thanks so much for having me, Bill. Appreciate it. This is a very trying time for the nation and the world, especially for healthcare workers everywhere. You are on the front lines. You know perhaps more about what we're going through than anyone else. Could you sum up for our viewers where we are right now as a state? Because things aren't looking that good. Sure, you're right. Things are not looking good. In fact, uh, just today we surpassed a weekly um, average daily count of cases being reported of around 3,000 a day, which is 
pretty staggering uh, when you think about a few months ago when we were well below a thousand. Now, some of that maybe catch up from delayed reporting over the most recent holiday, which was Thanksgiving. But no matter what the explanation is, it's accompanied by and been accompanied by a really worrisome, probably the most worrisome thing, increase in hospitalizations as well as deaths. So the hospital situation in Alabama right now is very worrisome, as many people have been saying. In fact, yesterday, looking at the statewide availability of intensive care beds, it looked very low, probably the lowest that we've seen since the pandemic began. So I would say we are at a very uh, dire uh, place in the pandemic, and, and the concern is that we haven't even been seen first of it because we haven't seen the effects yet probably of travel and mingling uh, socializing over the Thanksgiving holiday and those are starting to be seen now because uh, we're obviously just about a week out over a little over a week out from Thanksgiving um, but if that continues to reverberate over the next week coupled with people starting to travel for the Christmas holidays uh, and the end of the year season, that could really put us in a very, very dire position. I'll just finish by saying that if you look at the positivity of the tests that are performed, and that's one metric we've been using consistently over time. So of all the tests that are performed, how many are positive? We've been aiming for less than 5%. When you look at places that have gotten a handle on the pandemic, they generally have gotten down to about 3%, like New York and Seattle. In general, today, we were at 30%. So one in three people who was tested uh, was positive. And in several of our counties in the state, it's actually above 40% now. And almost nobody is below 20%, a handful of places. So this just says to me that when you go outside and you meet somebody or are with people, there's a really good chance, probably more than 10% easily, that people, someone you meet or are going to be around is going to be infected and probably infectious with COVID. So Bottom line, really critical time. I'm not sure we're seeing the end of it yet. I don't think we've turned the corner and very concerned about the days to come. And, and we are as well. And it's it, those of us who look at it every day see that these numbers have increased and increased the numbers that we never expected uh, in the beginning. Is this a matter of that people are not taking precautions seriously? I mean, is that does it, is it that simple that people are not wearing masks or not social distancing or not following the, the basic guidelines? I think that's the most logical inference. Um, I would temper it by a couple of comments. One is that this virus is so infectious that even people who have been very conscientious um, have occasionally gotten infected. And that's because we're all human. We all have minor lapses. You obviously have to take your mask off when you're eating and drinking, and maybe you can't eat and drink by yourself for six months, right? Which most of us can't. So um, I wanna be cautious and not create a culture of blame about this, um, because I think that's part of the reason we've gotten into this in the first place. Um, I, I do think there's great evidence that when people do ratchet up their mask wearing, their social distancing, their really not total shutdown, but really very, very, very strict measures, that you see a pretty instantaneous, over the course of seven to 14 days, you see a good trend downwards in the new cases. And we're seeing that now in the United Kingdom. We're starting to see it in the upper Midwest, which has been hit really hard in the last month. So I do think it works, and, and I think that you know people have just gotten tired of hearing it, um, but they need to revisit it again. Well, we call it pan, uh, uh, we call it pandemic fatigue around here. Uh, one of the things that we have promised now of two vaccines that look like they may come online in the next few weeks, uh, perhaps before the end of the year. Can you tell us a little bit about the vaccines, their safety and efficacy as you know? 
Sure. So the two vaccines that are farthest along um, are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. Pfizer was the first vaccine um, to to, um, to get ahead of, of the other groups. Those vaccines have one important thing in common. They are both something called messenger RNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines. Um, this is a technology that essentially takes little pieces of genetic material are then encoded or encased in a fatty particle called a lipid nanoparticle. That's what's injected into your muscle. Your muscle cells take up that genetic material and then it essentially directs your own DNA to make the viral proteins to which we want your body to produce antibodies. And that's, that's essentially how it works. You may have heard about the spike protein, which is sure. one of those things that comes off on the corona. That's the a antibody that we are targeting uh, to, against that protein. So what is, um, so this is a technology we've never used before. And, and there are, I think, a lot of questions about, about safety. Um, and I think they are great questions. Um, theoretically, this should be a product that should not last long. Messenger RNA is notoriously unstable. It's actually hard to study. It decays very quickly. So we are reasonably certain it's not the kind of thing that you have with gene. I think that's people's major confusion and concern, and it's totally understandable. This is not something that's going to integrate itself or insert itself into your genes. It just gets in your cell. It tells your genes quickly to make these proteins, and then it goes ahead and does that. So, so I think that that's something that people need to understand. The, the safety data is early. So right now, we have a median follow-up of people that has been formally released to the FDA of about two and a half months. So it's not really very much in the long scheme of things when you think about 30 year olds, 40, 50 year olds getting vaccinated, right? You really want long-term safety data. We're not gonna have that um, in the next you know, month. We will have progressively more um, as people are followed up in those vaccine studies. Um, but I mean, I will be first in line to get one of those vaccines. And in fact, the Pfizer vaccine is coming to Alabama. We're going to get probably around 50,000 um, vaccine doses really pretty soon. And we'll be getting some at, at UAB. I think there will be six regional distribution hospitals. Um, and so I can tell you that many of us who've seen the consequences of this pandemic and who are vaccine champions uh, will be first in line to get it because I I think, for my mind, the, um, the benefits are totally worth the risk. But I do think we have to acknowledge that people have valid concerns. I'll quickly talk about the efficacy and then turn it back to you. The efficacy um, has astonished people. Um, we were thinking that maybe we would get a 60%, ideally a 70% efficacy. And instead, both of these vaccines turned out to have a 94 to 95% efficacy, which was really remarkable. The other interesting thing is that um, in, in one of the vaccines, not only did it prevent infection, but it prevented severity of infection. So in all the cases, is where people were severely ill, and in one case where people died, um, that occurred in the placebo group. So really a home run, I would say, <coughs> in, in terms of what looks <coughs> like a very effective uh, vaccine. Now, the last question is how long that lasts. Um, we don't really know. Um, you know, notoriously, the coronavirus antibodies don't last very long, and that's why you keep getting infected with colds every year. Um, but we're hopeful that vaccine-induced immunity may give us a longer-lasting level of protection. So all of that is going to be up in the air and for intense study over the next several months. Well, it does seem that there is some light at the end of this dark winter that we're in now. Thank you for all you do and for Please stay safe and thank your staff from us and all people in Alabama for doing the hard work. And thank back you. at you. Thanks for the coverage. Take care. All right. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our special guest today has been Dr. Gene Barazzo. We'll be right back.
What are you doing today, babe? I thought I'd head down to the lake with the guys, do a little fishing. Of course, none of us will be wearing our seat belts. I'll lose control of the truck, wrap it around a tree, and kill us all. Okay. Drive safe, Alabama. A message from your Alabama Department of Transportation. 20 bucks. It won't buy much in the way of Christmas cheer. Yet it means plenty of hope for the homeless. Your $20 feeds 10 at the Jimmy Hale Mission. The more you give, the more we feed. Help us nurture those with nothing else and show them the true spirit of the season. To give, please call 323-5878 or visit jimmyhalemission.com today. Although it's been said many times, many ways, Merry Christmas to you. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Susan, Josh, you're not gonna believe this. The legislature is telling the governor's office that they want one more bite at the prison building apple. They, they wanna pass some legislation, they wanna get it right this time to build more prisons. What do you think, Susan? Malarkey. Malarkey. Malarkey, that's yeah, they've been They've been trying to do this for years, they can't agree. This is just gonna be another waste of time in this legislative mm. session. They've never mm. been able to do it. There's, Ivy's already moving ahead, why bother? Well, Josh, it would be ideal if they could do it, right? But we can't well, trust them to get it done. I don't, I don't know that it would necessarily be ideal. <laughs> I've seen our legislature work. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I, I'll say this, I, I do think it's a, it's a pander. And, I, and I, I think where a lot of it comes from is from, you've seen these communities now, uh, in Elmore County is one, uh, where the people in those communities are outraged about a new pr major prison going into their, into their community. And so they're going to go in and they're going to say, listen, we want to do this for you. We want to help you out and, and be, you know, men and women of the people, uh, so to speak, and, and pretend as though this is all some, uh, you know, it's really weighing heavy on them and they're going to try their best to get it done. But in the end, Either the Democrats or the governor are going to foil them at this, and so it's it's oh you know what could they do? What could they do? Waste of time. The, Waste yeah. of time. The, listen, we have sat through eight years yes. at least of them trying to do something to build new prisons, mm -hmm. and they have gotten nothing done. No. That you know the definition yeah. of uh, in, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> yeah, and, it's all uh, going to be a self-serving. It's a, it's a self-serving show. That's all it is. Yeah, it is. Listen, Governor Ivey has decided to do the tough things. She's doing it. If I were a legislator, I'd go, have at it, Gov. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to move to an issue that we expect to see uh, the gambling study group's report here in the next week or so. Uh, from what we're hearing, it's a very fair report, Josh. It, mm -hmm. it would not allow for anybody to have a monopoly. It would uh, regulate heavily the gaming industry, and it would tax it heavily. Uh, there's already gaming here. This, we've got to solve this issue, and we need to do it this year. Yeah, uh, look, you, you're right about all of that, uh, and, and that's what I've heard as well about this, and, and I would expect that from, from Todd Strains, the former Montgomery mayor, that uh, this is it's going to be a, a non-controversial, uh, split-the-baby kind of a thing. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think... Honestly, I think that's what works best. Uh, you know, we're, given the way the federal law works, you're never, ever going to be able to, uh, to overcome the uh, Porch Creek Indians' uh, places of business there and, and their right to operate things. So you need to figure out a way to work with them uh, within this. The same thing is going to go for uh, the folks like Victory Land and Green Track that are lifebloods to those communities uh, there right. that they serve. 
Uh, you're never going to be able to get the uh, the representatives and senators that represent in those districts uh, to come off of those places because they mean so much to the local economies there. And so you're going to have to figure out something to get everybody on the same page. And I think we're we're close. We're, close. we're a lot closer than we ever have been before to getting that done. And and here's the other thing about it: if you look at states surrounding us, especially like the, go to Tennessee for example, and look what they've done uh, with sports book gambling uh, online and some other things. Man, you know, they're hauling in a lot of cash, and, and that's a lot of cash for this state. And let me tell you, a lot of people in this state are playing those sports books in those surrounding states and are gambling in those surrounding states, and we're losing a lot of revenue and creating a lot of problems for Alabama citizens that we don't have revenue to address. Susan, it's estimated at $750 million yeah, a that year. would go into the state coffers. An- annually, a yeah. year. Yeah. Can you imagine what we could do with that kind of money in this state? Of course, you'd have to take it out of the legislature's hands. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, you you could you could you could expand Medicaid. You could give everybody that wants to go to a two-year college a mm-hmm. a, uh, a a scholarship, and that's just a couple of things that we could do. Mm-hmm. Fix a lot of holes in the budget. Yeah, yeah I mean, well, it, you, it does a lot you of good. Can. Yeah, I, I just, you know, what what I want to see more than anything is something where you could take this and, and build, a, say, an education foundation on this, on this money. Uh, and, and that, to me, is something that could change the future of this state uh, for a lot of young people uh, and, and for a lot of old people, for that matter. And, you know, I think that is something that we could absolutely do. And you could create growth if you do it right. Well, I, I agree with you on this. I do want to remember in this last uh, minute Rosa Parks, 65 years ago on December 1st, refused to give up her seat to a white man, and Susan, she changed the world. She did, and she was, she was, uh, that was a good seat. It wasn't that she was sitting in the white person section. She was sitting in the black folks section, and he still made her get it. Well, she didn't get up, Josh. Nope. No, no, they, they were, you know, the bus driver was trying to break the law. And she said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that today, my man. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rosa Parks was uh, uh, was a bad, bad lady uh, long, be- and I mean that in a good way, was a bad, bad lady yeah. long before she sit- took that seat on that bus that day. Uh, she did a lot yes. of things, and I'd encourage everybody out there to, uh, to go look at Rosa Parks' history. Absolutely. You can, you can check it out online. She was an amazing woman, and we are so thankful that she – was an Alabamian. Mm-hmm. All right, you've been watching the V, the voice of Alabama politics. You watch us because we watch them.